Uh, <coughs> good <coughs> excuse me, afternoon, everybody. I'm Alex Friedland. I'm the uh, 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 chairman and co-founder of Mirantis. I'm also a director of uh, OpenStack Foundation. And um, um, one of the things that uh, we do here at Mirantis is we work with a lot of customers who I wanted to learn about OpenStack. So my role is I run community engineering, but also kind of community outreach for Mirantis. And um, one of the challenges that uh, we're dealing with is how do you bridge the gap between um, what people's expectations are and who's coming into the OpenStack community and the community itself. So, but so, um, we've been doing this fairly successfully or reasonably successfully in the last uh, you know, several years, but the situation is rapidly changing. And what's happening is um, OpenStack is really, you know, becoming a runaway train. And um, I don't know, uh, you know, the, the audience here, but uh, for us, it's, uh, it's certainly becoming clear that, you know, this market is accelerating. Uh, we've reached escape velocity and OpenStack is just uh, pretty much won the battle of internal clouds. It will be the fabric that will glue together the data center infrastructure. Um, it's no longer just something that developers play with because if you look at the history of how even a larger company's adoption was happening, it was happening in a developer-centric way. So developers would have a skunk works in somewhere, they'll have protection of the business people, and that's how projects would start. So developers would kind of get like it, they will um, collaborate with the developers in the community and things would go fine. So. Once you start moving into mainstream, this is no longer happening. You know, this is, it's like your um, you know, teenage daughter is writing you a love note and you know, it's, 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 it's as naive and happy people coming into the community, which is great, we want that. But uh, what do we do to make them successful is the question. So what other ramifications? So instead of developer-led tactical adoption, we're starting to see strategic adoption. We see that some really strong enterprise-grade architects are studying OpenStack and saying, okay, what will it need to be for us to be successful long-term? And, uh, you know, there are challenges in some of the implementation architecture. And, of course, there are commercial adoption plans that people are putting together that depend on whether or not OpenStack can solve certain problems. So the many stakeholders who are now starting to do this in a commercial setting are actually have no experience in the community engineering, they have no idea, you know, how to do open source per se, but they need those things sold. So what they do is, they do it in the way they're used to, and they, uh, you know, reach out to the engineers in the community, and what they get is something like this. You know, if it's an obvious idea, they go, yes, so. And as I said, we we'll like your opinion, but we kind of have our own. And by the way, if you happen to not speak the, um, you know, the Garrett, the, um, you know, the, the, you know all, the, all the lingo that developers are talking, you're not really somebody who will talk to you anyway. So why are you wasting our time here? And um, um, we are seeing this left and right. You know, OpenStack development is governed, you know, by OpenStack developers. And if, you know, those of you who know how governance works, we have all the business issues are managed by the foundation, the board of directors, and all the developers all the development technical issues are um, managed by a technical committee. Now, technical committee has, you know, distinguished technologies, technologists who are there, and uh, the business folks have no um, authority over the technical decisions made in the community, uh, which is great because OpenStack is allowed to be a meritocracy, but it means it's very hard to drive agenda that is not something that developers like. And developers, you know, they work on things that they like to work on, and uh, uh, it creates, you know, a quick question. So I'll, I'll just share a story with you. We have a very large and um, respected um, partner and customer. Um, um, I'm not going to name names, but you know, it's a very, very large company with tremendous and deep experience uh, developing cloud platforms, you know, commercial cloud platforms for telco business, you know, five nines, really, really strong. And they, they really made a strong commitment to OpenStack. And their technical guys started to kind of embrace OpenStack and look at this, and they have the big uh, development plan. So their senior level architects came up with some ideas, said, you know, the way OpenStack is doing is kind of childish. We'll 
kind of suggest our own improvements, went to the community, you know, published a whole bunch of blueprints, went in and started talking to the core developers and projects. And I said, ah, you know, uh, it's great, but you know, the architecture of Nova doesn't really support it. And the fact that it doesn't belong there, it needs to be somewhere else. So just like, and the guy, is, you know, he's used to having, having his way. He started to push to say, well, but you know, you know, we really know what we're doing. It's like, ah, you don't know how to talk to us. You're not being polite. I'm not going to talk to you. Goodbye. And um, then he says, okay, I'll be polite. You know, what should I do? It doesn't belong to Nova. You know, it should be a meta thing somewhere else. So go talk to these people. He said, well, maybe you can suggest to do it on my behalf. He says, no, no, no. We know people here. You know, we don't talk to those people. So it's like, don't waste our time. Goodbye. And the whole thing blew up. And, you know, thankfully, uh, you know, they're, they're big Mirantis customers, so we, we called a few people in the community. We kind of quieted everybody down. We had a training session to those guys to explain how the community works. We took some community leaders who said, okay, you know, please be their ambassadors to the community because it's so important to open stack and all this. And now we're handling it. Things are happening better. But clearly, um, it's not a scalable model where you got to have you know, CEO of Mirantis and the chairman of Mirantis kind of interject because some developers couldn't agree. So, there, you know, but it's a real issue that um, we have to address. So, um, and, uh, you know, this is sort of, you know, a, a visual way, you know, to kind of, you know, so sometimes you have to be like, you know, a climber. Um, it, it could be very dangerous because you have, very unhappy customer on one end, you know, a very smart developer on the other hand who couldn't care less, and you have to kind of, you know, climb this, this thing, and you know, if you if you make a mistake, you'll fall down. So, um, okay. So what what we looked at is we said, okay, but what is it, and how does it work in other open source ecosystems? Because you know, clearly, OpenStack isn't the first, and. Um, in, in other OpenStack ecosystems, this problem is actually solved by typically the owner of the ecosystem. Because, you know, if you look at examples, I, you know, I chose uh, CloudStack and Alfresco. Those are sizable um, ecosystems. And, uh, of course, we all know that CloudStack is an alternative to OpenStack to build a cloud platform. But if you look at it closely enough, it's really, you know, it's open source and it's Apache and all that. But it's really closely dominated by Citrix. Citrix is the one who originally bought cloud.com, and they're the ones pushing it. And so uh, Citrix makes all the product decisions as to how you drive this, this, this ecosystem. And yes, there are a number of developers who kind of go, but if you look at all the key areas of control, they are developed by, by Citrix engineers using your normal product management process where you have you know, a backlog is based on what customers want, architecture is centrally managed, and then, yes, it's done in open source you know, as, as a way to conquer the market where open source becomes an engine of making, making it cheaper to sell as opposed to a way to develop. Alfresco is very similar. Uh, Linux is a little bit different, but we all know that um, um, you know, Linux, well, first of all, it took tens of years to develop to where it is today. OpenStack is moving much, much faster. And second, from day one, there was a benevolent dictator in Linux making, um, you know, many of those hard decisions. And um, many, many are saying that the success of the Linux ecosystem is, you know, mainly, you know, to a large extent is to what, you know, Linus Torvalds has, has accomplished. So OpenStack um, doesn't have, you know, either of these two um, setups. So that being said, you know, can, can we do this? Well, so, so you know, we, we, we have some very dominant players in the ecosystem, but um, OpenStack is way too big and too diverse to be controlled by one company. And we're seeing, for example, Red Hat being very, very strong and emerging as a very large player in the ecosystem, you know, number one in, um, in contributions and the like. But um, there are two issues there. One is the mission of OpenStack is to be able to actually take the diverse uh, technology stacks inside the enterprise and be able to be driven from one control plane. 
So the, the, the users will not accept even a very, you know, a very good dominant player as the dominant player. And that's why the community is so large and diverse because there are so many interests. Uh, OpenStack is much larger than Linux. Linux is just, you know, one piece of the stack. Um, and OpenStack already has all of the infrastructure of compute storage and network and is moving up the stack now with services and application components and all that. And there isn't even one company that even if they wanted to, they would have um, capability to innovate so fast or have competency in all this. So um, OpenStack is just way too you know, large, diverse, and configurable to be able to do this. OpenStack has unique use cases to a whole number of industries, right? So you know, service providers kind of started this whole move. Uh, you know, then we're seeing, you know, telecoms and then, you know, the network function virtualization plays happening. Then the Web 2.0 folks were the second wave. Now we're seeing classical IT enterprise, you know, enterprise IT folks are starting to use OpenStack. Now the use cases go into dev and production and, you know, hybrid clouds. So there's just no way something that diverse could be centrally managed. So um, we have to find a way um, to, you know, to, to, to solve this problem without a vendor or a benevolent dictator. Now, there is another kind of challenge that we as a community are facing, and it's an existential problem for OpenStack, because OpenStack came out of an economic need to uh, level the playing field uh, where computing as a resource needs to be delivered at a price point that, at that scale, at a price point that's compatible to what these guys are doing. So, but you know, price point of VMware is easier. But if you look at people like you know, uh, Amazon Web Services and Google, and you know, eventually Microsoft, uh, the, you know, but the Google and Amazon are the first examples. They've been able, they, they've showed the world that can, they can, they can deliver, uh, they can. Internally, they can deploy technology, computing technology, at a price point that's orders, order, or orders of magnitude less than um, what traditional IT enterprises are doing. Then, of course, they open sourced many of those technologies and made them available you know, to the world. But if, they, if these, you know, these companies, Google and, um, and Facebooks and the like, if they would have consumed uh, technology at the same price point that Citibank is consuming technology today or American Express, then, and Mark Andreessen said at first, I'm just repeating his words, then there wouldn't be a Google because the price that they would pay to the vendors like HP and Oracle and, and, you know, and, 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 and others would be larger than the revenues that Google can make. Uh, so, you know, so Google had to innovate you know, by orders of magnitude in being able to uh, consume complex technology, you know, computing services at a very different price point. And now people like Google and people like Amazon are making it available to the outside world uh, and creating this very, very important resource called general computing, right? Available at a whole different price point and easy to consume. Now, what's happening is the enterprises look at this and they kind of see this, you know, if you look at this problem holistically, you kind of understand that this resource is extremely strategic. And if you are a large company, for example, in banking or in trading, it's how you trade and you know, the details and the intricacies of that becomes a differentiation against your competitor. So the very resource you use to trade all belongs to Amazon or Google, uh, then you have about as much power and control over it as we as consumers have against our public utilities, right? So we have none. Uh, because they have it all, we plug in the wall, they tell us how much it's going to cost, hopefully they're regulated. If there's an outage, we can complain, but nothing happens. Now, if you're a large enterprise, you can't afford that kind of control for that strategic resource. So there has to be an alternative to this that as powerful and strong, and that's what OpenStack is proposing to become. But in order for this to work, we have to be able to use OpenStack to, to deliver the, uh, you know, the computing resource at the same price point as Amazon and Google will be available to do. And uh, that's the challenge. So if, if, and for that, the technology itself needs to become competitive to these guys. And, you know, and that, that's a tall order. And so we as a community have to be able to deliver it at the same quality. And there's plenty of people who are helping. And that's what, you know, especially now in the mainstream, that's, you know, the large companies are willing to put their resources in there. It's just, can we take it? So, um, and today, if you look at uh, the community, there is no one holistic view 
of OpenStack. Engineering community, you know, everybody works on their individual projects. They know what this is. They don't understand what the impact of this will be to uh, other projects. And so, um, th th there needs to be ways that community can self-organize and actually help, you know, to drive it as as a number of resources goes up. So, uh, up up until now. The hard decisions on how this works have been driven by vendors. So, you know, Mirantis did their share, and uh, Red Hat did, and HP did, and IBM did, you know, we're all top contributors. But as we become hugely larger, this is not enough. So what, what is necessary for this to work is we need to drive two things. We need to drive neutrality and transparency into OpenStack. And um, both are very important. Neutrality is essentially what will allow OpenStack to be agnostic to vendor interests and ultimately will allow the customer to have a leverage over vendor interest where they can take one vendor who is more expensive or less innovative and replace them with another without destroying everything that's running on top of the platform. And that's the value of OpenStack. And transparency means that everybody can see uh, what's happening in the community, who is doing what, and you can make decisions based on hard data. And so I think this is the only way we can self-organize community. And uh, we at Mirantis actually have been, have been doing this for quite a while, and uh, I'll give you a couple of things. Now, how many of you know what Stackalytics is? Okay, about, about half. Um, so we started Stackalytics um, um, about a year ago as a way to, um, you know, to show transparency into community contributions, and we've expanded it greatly since. And uh, it looks like you know, um, the, the foundation is now starting to work closer, and probably Stackalytics may end up being part of Storyboard or something like this. But it's, a, it's become kind of a default tool that um, both technologists are using to see who is doing what in the community, the press, the, the business folks, to kind of understand you know, what companies are doing separately, who are the people, what exactly they work on, and then drill down to the, you know, the actual work that's happening. Um, so we did it originally to kind of drive our own contribution statistics, but then it became a tool for everybody. And we very specifically, we made sure that um, it's a very easy to consume, a very intuitive tool because you want to make sure that people who don't understand the intricacies and details of what, how Garriott works and how GitHub works and all those things can still get the relevant information. Um, so um, that, that, that's like a first iteration is to kind of show who is doing what. Uh, but if you look at Stackalytics, and I'll drive a little demo to kind of show where we're taking it, uh, there are other things that you can look at above and beyond you know, who are the companies and who are the people who contribute. Now, I'll give you another example of transparency that will allow community to self-organize. Uh, and this is a project rally that, uh, again, Mirantis started, but now there is a fairly significant community that's built around it, even though rally has technically not yet been even, even applied for incubation. It's already one of the more active projects on StackForge, which is kind of the, the greater um, um, OpenStack innovation sandbox. Um, so originally, um, you know, our developers noticed that some of the algorithms in, um, um, in OpenStack were such that as you start scaling the, the, you know, the, the, the number of VMs and you know, different use cases, it will actually not scale very well. And um, they tried to go you know, to different projects in the community and suggest that some of the architectural ideas don't really work well. And it was difficult to prove because for the use cases and the interests of that particular clump or you know, snowflake or area of this particular project, people didn't see you know, the holistic picture of the whole thing. And so where you could address it locally, they couldn't understand how their change would affect another you know, piece in a different, different part of OpenStack. And so what uh, one of our developers, you know, Boris Pavlovich, decided to do is to build a tool that would give you an easy way to take OpenStack and just, you know, profile it. And um, not only to profile it, but, you know, to, to define a use case across it, you know, deploy it, do whatever you need, and then the profiler will show you exactly 
what is happening and where the bottleneck is. And we'll give you, you know, a report similar to this one where anybody can understand what's happening. And they can kind of you know, see if it's this way or this way, and it immediately becomes problematic. And so <coughs> people commercially realize that if they're using OpenStack, they need to have a profiler to kind of understand this is a precursor to building an SLA. But something else happened that is very important. That's why I decided to bring it to a community discussion. Uh, lots of people said it's a good idea to take Rally as a tool and embed it into the holistic testing that we're doing across all of OpenStack, you know, driven by Tempest, which is the, the, the QA engine, uh, so that the gates for each change will include the effects we do on all of OpenStack as measured by Rally. So you then suddenly have, not only you have the uniform information that you can use, and if the community agrees it's a standard, I can go and say, if you make this change, here's a rally benchmark, it will actually be a problem, right? So suddenly a person here will be paying attention to it because it will become part of you know, data he couldn't dispute. We also make it a standard acceptance criteria which says, hey, not only you do this, every time we test, we run this, and it's a gate, and if it fails, you can't go in. So you automate it and you scale across the whole thing. So it's a good example of how you drive, you know, in this, in this, in this particular case, performance, how you drive performance into a very diverse community. And again, the two drivers there is transparency, right, and consistency of data. So we create transparency, we educate the community, and community will self-organize around that. And so I think that um, uh, this is, in general, a way a community of this size can, can drive improvement consistently, and there is no other way. There is no prescriptive way. It has to be you know, through transparency. So um, something similar, um, and I'll do a small demo here, um, um, and I'll move. Let's see. How do I do that? Uh, oh, it switched. So. Let's see, yeah, okay. So um, this is a new version of Stackalytics that just came in, and I'll show you how this transparency is also driving something on the marketing side, which is important. So um, everyone have seen this, which is the code contribution, you know, and just for those who haven't used it, it's stackalytics.com. I believe uh, something similar will soon be coming. You'll, you'll be able to see it from the foundation dashboard. But the idea here is you can choose your release, your project type, modules within the company, and just do filtering as to you know, who does what. And specifically in June of today, we can see you know, this is you know, commits. And the other choices you see here could be, if it ever wakes up, you can see reviews. And you can see, um, well, are we, are we online here? Yeah, we are. So commits. Uh, completed blueprints, drafted blueprints, emails, lines of code, and reviews. And by the way, all of this is taken live from the actual live systems where all this work is happening. So again, there is no agenda here. It just takes the information that's available and presents it in a way that is easy to consume. So it just provides transparency. And you can see sort of, you know, who the, you know, by commits, you know, who are the largest committers, or if you want to look at reviewers, who are the largest reviewers, and then specifically by project, by company, and you can drill down and do whatever you need to do. So we decided, um, and that was an initiative that was run by the foundation uh, and the technical community together. We said that one of the important drivers for adoption uh, of OpenStack is we need to have as many vendors who know what OpenStack is uh, to actually embrace OpenStack. Because ultimately, OpenStack would be useless unless you can actually have storage vendors and compute and network and others, embrace it, create drivers, support them, make sure they work well. Now, if you are an enterprise customer, if you are, I don't know, Wells Fargo Bank, you know, who did a keynote here, how do you decide which um, um, vendor to use? Well, at first, what you do is you do it in a prescriptive way. You meet with every vendor. You're a big case. Everybody runs to you and you kind of do the POCs with all of them and you choose something. Now, the reason you get OpenStack to begin with is that if one vendor is actually falling behind, you have a chance to change it with a different vendor and nothing that runs on top of OpenStack will notice. So that's, that's why OpenStack is interesting. Now, reality today is not quite there, but that's, where, you know, that's the nirvana that we all want. 
um, ultimately that's what's happening in Amazon, right? You're on top of Amazon, you don't know what's happening underneath. And so if Amazon figures out that there is a provider who can do the same thing at one seventh the price, they will start buying that storage vendor, for example, and we the users will never know, right? So OpenStack kind of has the same promise. Uh, so how would Wells Fargo in this particular example decide what vendor is there? You can't run POCs on all of them. That will eventually be you know, too hard to do. So one of the ways to do it is we create a marketplace uh, for all the vendors and we make it self-service. And this is something that traditionally before uh, open source has been done by large vendors. So if you're you know, VMware, you certify your vendors and you tell them who the certified vendors are and typically it's also a way to lock people in because your channels allow you, you know, only a certain subset of vendors and then others cannot penetrate so you can charge a premium price. Here, that's not the case at all and we saw a brilliant example. I've always been using this example in public talks a few days ago. There's a price tag now for this. Um, Ceph, you know, how many of you know Ceph or heard of Ceph? Everybody. Well, if you're in OpenStack, you kind of know that Ceph is the, you know, has become a default choice for storage. And, um, uh, but Ceph, you know, how did Ceph come about? Uh, they come about as a spin out from um, uh, DreamHost, right? And they just decided that they're gonna use OpenStack as their use case. Now previously, if OpenStack weren't around, if you build a storage startup and you have a great innovative idea, how do you go about this? Well, you build this idea, then you go and you hire five or six strong enterprise sales guys with a price tag of $300,000 a year plus at quota, because otherwise they wouldn't come. And then you spend th two years and probably $30 million in trying to establish five serious use cases with a bunch of enterprises proving that technology works. Once you've done that, then people like EMC will kind of start noticing you and say, well, maybe we should consider because enough customers uh, enough customers asked for it, so VMware is noticing it, and then EMC is looking at this, and what happens is, you know, five years later, if you survive so long, then, you know, EMC will buy you, you know, for some money, put you into a VMware channel, by the way, they racket the price by 10x, and you're done. That's innovation. Take Ceph and OpenStack. They came up with something very, very young, very good, and they said, we're gonna make OpenStack the driver to market, the, 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 the single channel to market. So they just focused on this, they understood all the use cases, they went out, wrote great drivers, found people in the community who wanted to do those use cases, integrated with everybody, um, you know, with Mirantis at first in services, then Mirantis OpenStack, then a bunch of other people. And before we knew it, there's like 50 use cases, everybody loves it, it's cheap, it's great, it works well. Now Red Hat had to work with it even though they had Gluster. Right? And the whole amount of money they spent was what, you know, I think they raised less than $15 million. Most of it was spent on engineering to actually innovate the product and maybe a million dollars on the marketing side. And lo and behold, they're already, you know, de facto standard. Everybody is working with that. They're integrated into VMware. Red Hat needs to work with them too. Before you know it, Red Hat decides to buy 175 million in like 18 months of work. So, and by the way, for all the customers, it's a great story because they've been able to use Ceph where the alternatives weren't available otherwise. And you know, OpenStack kind of made it possible, right? So um, now, there are many conversations about what's gonna happen now that Red Hat purchased Ceph. Will Ceph be as popular because one of the attractiveness of it was vendor agnostic and the like. But my answer to this is very simple. We don't need to know because what's happening is infrastructure space is incredibly large and there's incredible amount of innovation that can happen there. So rather than guessing what's gonna happen, we just open it up and create a marketplace for, you know, for vendors to compete. And so we created the, the, um, the vendor log thing, which is essentially a way to transparently see who works well with OpenStack and how. And um, so we've been working there, like, like I said, with the foundation and with the community. And um, what we did is the foundation uh, agreed to create a new trademark that's called uh, OpenStack Compatible, which is something that if you want to sell to OpenStack customers, being certified by the foundation of OpenStack Compatible, if you are a vendor that provides components to OpenStack, it's a good thing, right? It will something that will give, give your customers comfort that you know what you're doing. So 
So you can get this logo, and then we said, you know, how, how do you do this? And there's a certain number of rules that says, A, you have a driver, a component upstream, and all that, but most importantly, you can show that you are consistently over time passing all the standard tests in your reference architecture that works on top of OpenStack. So there is a way to build you know, CI, CD environment that, that integrates with OpenStack. We, you know, actually some of, some of our Mirantis architects, you know, Jay Pipes uh, was actually working on this. So he published you know, a number of white papers explaining how you do it. Then we marketed it outside and a whole bunch of vendors actually integrated in that. And then you plug yourself in here and as every day that you know, the builds are being run, you, you, know, you have an environment that you run also with them when you report the, the results upstream. And as a result now, when you have a stable build, you have your vendors who are working with OpenStack. We have data that says my build passed, my build failed, and so on and so forth. I can show it actually in a Stackalytics-like, or in this case, Stackalytics thing, and then it will float into the uh, foundation marketplace. So there's total transparency and there is now self-service way for customers, I mean for, for vendors, to go in and certify themselves. And this is pretty much how it's done. So, and you can see Stackalytics is going to give you a simple interface. You can, you know, choose project, you know, sender for, for, for storage and, you know, others, you know, Neutron for networking or or no one networking, what have you. Then vendor, driver, and then trunk and whether or not a CI tested. And if it's CI tested, you can just say, well, who are the ones who are passing the tests? And, you know, for Cinder, and here you go, uh, you know, Sheepdog volume driver. So whoever that is, you can click and see who those people are. Um, we have some very slow internet for some reason. I don't know what's happening. But, um, yeah, so there's a description and kind of, kind of tells you who those are and, you know, who the people are and so on and so forth. And, um, um, you know, if you want to look at um, other people, so Arista, they have um, a driver for all these and it's actually passing. And there should be, um, um, there should be also, and let me see if that's not published here, but uh, there is also a thing here that says maintainer. And there are actually people, and I'm not sure why it's not showing here, but uh, it actually shows you who are the people maintaining the drivers. So if you have a question, you know where to go in the community. But if you are a customer and you're thinking you know, uh, about who to use, you can just go to this thing, find all the people with the green check mark, and say, these are the people I want to talk to first. Right? And uh, it creates a huge incentive for the vendors and the people who are innovating to just come and say, oh, if you want to be noticed, we just need to do two things. One, write a good thing, innovate the hell out of it, get in here, make sure we're visible, pass all the tests, and then create four or five use cases with people in the community, and we can be another SEF, which is a tremendous, you know, that is the value of the stack. So, and you know, the transparency mechanism is the one that will actually drive the community to, to innovate. So, let's go back to the presentation if we can, and we can. So, and, um, um, so where do we go from here? So um, there are a couple of things that are happening in the, um, um, you know, in, um, in the community. So first of all, Board of Directors is running um, a few initiatives to get the users closer to the OpenStack, right? So first of all, there is uh, OpenStack user groups and there is, uh, you know, the whole, the whole um, movement is led by Tim Bell. And um, uh, in there, there is a big sec section for operators. We're trying to understand the use cases the operators are using. And then recently, in the last meeting, we agreed that we need to have a much more formal group that talks about users, you know, you know the actual users. You know, it could be developers who are building dev environments or something who are, who are customers of the operators. Right, and so we're now starting a work group under the user group that uh, Chris uh, came from Nebula and myself are going to be spearheading. And then, of course, there is an enterprise user group now, which is Intel is starting, uh, which is led by the Intel director, Imad. Um, so we're learning what use cases are really important for customers. And uh, what's good is uh, that the foundation is starting to actually put resources into that, you know. Um, uh, Tom uh, Fifield has actually been doing some work on the foundation side. And also, we're starting to have joint sessions between the board of directors and the technical committee. 
And if you look at how we're organized, you will notice that there is maybe two or three people who are, who are on both. But then the board of directors is very, very business. You know, they're all the business people and lawyers and all that. They're, you know, making sure that our trademarks are right. But, you know, the, the, we, we can drive the use cases. You know, we have the people who are interested in that. But how do you then translate that into the technical guys who are sitting there and saying, well, you know, it's just simple. Just give me a blueprint and Garrett, you know, or, you know, say plus one, and then we'll talk. So there needs to be there needs to be a better mechanism. And one of the discussions we've been having is um, what about trying to introduce an idea of product management in the community? Um, it's a new function. It's never been done before. And uh, people are ambivalent about it. Because one thing about product management, if you, if you work for a commercial company and you're a developer, you know that you want to do one thing and then some business guy is driving you to do something different, it's, it, it's a cause for creative tension. But without product management and product marketing, you wouldn't have an alignment between what customers want and what developers want to work on. So that function needs to be somehow represented. But um, you know, if we can actually institute it on the community, I don't know. So one of the ways to do this is to actually have this function, right? What is this function? To interact with non-technical OpenStack users and understand the use cases, then collect and prioritize requirements, and then publish, you know, translate them into the language that uh, developers will understand, which are blueprints um, that then developers can start working on. And then as you do that, um, you will be able to attract people who don't speak OpenStackish, whatever that language is, but they can tell you what is it that they need and that will get translated into a blueprint requirement. And then you use Stackalytics engine to provide the mar marketplace for features, which means that if this is something that's important, the greater community of non-technical Stackalytics users can say plus one to this particular blueprint, that blueprint will float on top. And again, if you look at um, um, the way Stackalytics works, um, going back into code contribution. Um, I can actually go and look at you know, drafted blueprints. And it will show me you know, who the people you know, who did the blueprints are. So there is date on blueprints already. So why not go and say, OK, you know, here are all the blueprints. Review the blueprints you know, for networking this and that. And then if you think, you know, here's a description of it. And if you like it, say plus one. And it can go to everybody. And then suddenly, you will see that there are some blueprints that nobody cares about. And there are some that are really in demand. Those will float on top. And developers, oh, it's a popular one. I better go work on it, because then I'll be famous. And that will create, again, an alignment. But we need you know, to have this function where those blueprints can be developed by people who don't speak open, open stackish. And so that's kind of where we are today. And um, um, I think this is the ne uh, next frontier. If we solve that, OpenStack can actually you know, make, make, make a much stronger leap into the mainstream and continue to be an innovative ecosystem. So this is all I had to share. Uh, but hopefully, you know, ideas and questions. Yeah, because ultimately, it's all about the community. So anybody wants to participate, any questions, please. Well, in the other communities that I mentioned, uh, if it's something that's managed by a vendor, like CloudStack or whatever, then the vendor will do it. If it's something that is managed with a benevolent dictator, <clears throat> he will decide both on the architecture and the features. And then, you know, um, we've never had anything so large. This is, I mean, we're, we're innovating here every day. This, this OpenStack, just I want to put things into perspective. OpenStack now is a larger foundation and larger community than, um, than Linux. Linux took 25 years to get there. OpenStack got there in three. We just reviewed the, uh, the financials. I think uh, we're going to have a $12 million budget this year for OpenStack Foundation. I think Linux has more like eight or nine after 25 years and being by far the largest. And Apache Foundation, which is a special foundation, I think it's maybe one-eighth of what OpenStack is today. So we've never, that has never been done before. Yes? In the session before you in this room, they were, he was speaking about uh, kernel versus OpenStack commits and so 
statistics and when the question came up about uh, how they were derived, he said, unless you go to GitHub and run your statistics from there, it's very hard to be transparent and something like Statolytic, Viturgia, Olo, all of these things, it's hard to know, to, get, uh, to be trustworthy in terms of visibility. Who was, who was the speaker? I came in late. I don't mm -hmm. know. So we had, it's an interesting discussion. We had many of those discussions. So at first, when we introduced Stackalytics, the foundation reacted really, really um, negatively because they felt that it allows somebody to have an agenda on uh, you know, how we present this data. And the reality of it is, the answer is no, because what's happening is Stackalytics is a project that sits there on StackForge, and it's written in the same language as OpenStack. So what we, and it's actually, we can actually do something here. I'll, I'll show you something. Um, so if I go back to Stackalytics, um, and let's see, how would I do that? I would do, click here. Oh, yeah, it's fine. So um, I can go and I can say, ah, it decided to disappear on me for whatever reason. Come on. Okay, so I'll try it again. I'll go, instead of OpenStack, I'll say all. And then when I say module, I'll find Stackalytics there. So let's just do it this way. And I can't see it. Stackalytics, the last one here. So what you, yeah, this is all Mirantis yet, but let me go from Juno to Ice, um, to Ice House. And you'll see a very different picture here when it comes up. Um, so Stackalytics is a project that's no different from Neutron or anything else. And you see in this particular case, uh, these are blueprints, so again, it's a bad view. Let's look at commits. Well, it's doing the same search, I guess, I'm afraid. Commits. Something is happening. You know, the... Uh, streaming movies. Yeah, oh, the, the internet is just being very slow. But, so here's commits. So when I do that, you will see that a number of people and companies that actually contributed to Stackalytics is actually quite large. So what we found out is happening is this that people who are doing contributions, and you see that Mirantis is still number one because we're driving this project, but you have Rackspace and HP and you know, EasyStack and Comcast and Cisco and a whole bunch of other people, right? So what's happening there? Well, some people decide that the way we're, you know, we're, we're counting lines and whatever, because we're taking it from GitHub, but maybe some, some of the algorithms can be changed. They're tweaking it, right? And you know, it's being reviewed. And we're taking this in. But some people are saying, well, you know, there's actually an exception. You know, we did this big thing. You know, the way you're counting this is incorrect. And they're coming in and they're fixing mistakes. The community is starting to self-govern. -gov and again, we're back to transparency. And by the way, uh, what's happening, we as somebody who drives this project, if we do something that is by anybody, you know, considered, I'll give you an example. Uh, Sahara, which, which is one of the projects that um, um, we, um, we ran, graduated from incubation into uh, mainstream, you know, became an integrated project. So as that happened, it became integrated in Juno. But unfortunately, the way Stackalytics was written, it's the date the decision was made, de decided when it's going into Stackalytics. So suddenly what happened is our Mirantis' contributions because of Sahara in Icehouse went up. The next day, we got a call from VMware, Dan Wendland, this you know, email, email said, guys, <laughs> it's not going, you are now number four, we should be number four in integrated. And by the way, since you guys do Stackalytics, the last thing you want is for somebody to think that you're manipulating data because you have control over it, so you better fix it. And you better believe it that you know, people stayed overnight and we fixed it. Because the last thing we want is our credibility being tarnished because we're manipulating, because there's transparency, right? Anybody can do, Anybody can see it. Anyone can, um, anyone can um, have an opinion on it. And if we start to be non-transparent, we will lose credibility. 
And, and that's not good. It's all about being respected in the community and being trusted in the community. So the, the argument that you can only go on GitHub, yes, but uh, we also go to GitHub. But how we interpret this data, for example, if you do a big green naming of everything, like Neutron. Neutron was called uh, Quantum before, and somebody went and renamed it. And suddenly, you know, Mark McLean did a dream host, became the largest contributor to, um, to OpenStack. So clearly that heuristic doesn't work, so we had to say, we had to do an exception. So we kind of changed it to zero, and Mark called me and said, that's unfair. Because there's a lot of work I had to do that actually was beyond renaming. So we kind of said, what is it? And for this particular thing, we decided the, line, you know, the right number is 5,000 lines. So he agreed, we agreed, and that's a special case, right? And in Stack Analytics, you can do it. In GitHub, you can't, because GitHub actually looks at the number of lines, and then what? So this is a much better mechanism because it's community governed. And people will make sure you're fair. So any more questions? Oh, yes? One more. Yeah, please. If you go to... Uh Ice House, um, instead of the first drop down Ice House, you just do all? Ice House all? No, yeah, instead of where it says uh, Ice House, release. Yes, we are not, well, this is Ice House, and this is all. Um, I, I'll talk to you after. So, um, by the way, so this is, this is just for people's information. So OpenStack, it has various parts of OpenStack that we can measure, right? So there is, OpenStack itself, you can have integrated and incubated projects where tracking documentation and infra separately, right? And so you can kind of see all of that. And um, many people just look at integrated because they, you know, those, those are the, the old core projects, right? And then, um, but then there is a number of them like you know, Trove and others which are part of OpenStack and of course infra itself. So we default to OpenStack as the, as the num, you know, number one thing. But then there's also StackForge. And what StackForge is, it's, a, it's, it's where you put projects for general innovation for the OpenStack ecosystem. So StackForge, if you want to do a new project that will be a candidate or just want to something for the community to be aware of, you put it in StackForge. And so we, you know, we trace things on StackForge, which is like the larger innovation sandbox that people have. And so all the new projects that are being offered, they go on StackForge and then they also go on the mailing list and people start discussing them. Right, so that was my question. Isn't integrated the best metric because that's what really shipping versus all the pie in the sky that's, stuff? That's not true. There are a lot of people who are shipping Trove, for example, which is not integrated yet. So um, it, it, um, there's a number of um, kind of large, you know, infra. Infra is very important because that, that's what actually makes sure that OpenStack is stable, right? And there's a lot of people who are contributing there, you know, you know, Tempest, for example, right? So, yes, you know, for shipping, integrated is more important, but for who contributes to greater OpenStack, you know, Monty Taylor, who runs Infra, probably contributes, you know, no less than uh, Russell Bryant, who used to run Nova. So... That's why we kind of say OpenStack is the main one because this is, this is not about what's shipping, that's about who contributes most in OpenStack. And if we just did this, Monty Taylor will be off this picture. It's totally unfair. Any, well, any suggestions? I mean, what, 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 what is your guys' experience? You know, how do you drive, how do you drive change in OpenStack? Any, any thoughts? If there are no thoughts from the seats. Well, if you guys, yes? I don't want to be the only one. So there's three markets, right? There's service provider, uh, enterprise, MSP. Are they all one project? Or they're taking salad, dessert, you know, starter, wine. They all take what they want from the menu. OpenStack is very configurable, right? So you should be able to, and OpenStack actually has a thin layer of APIs on top of the actual functionality. So you don't provide the actual functionality usually. And the use cases and what to integrate with is determined by OpenStack. And we have service providers and others. They, they have different use cases and we need to make sure that OpenStack can get those use cases operationalized. So today there's one OpenStack. Now, will, will there ever be OpenStack? You know, will it split and it will be OpenStack for operators and OpenStack for uh, enterprises? Hopefully not. Uh, but who knows? 
But that's why we have the work groups for operators, because we need to make sure we know exactly what these guys are wanting. We're starting a work group for enterprises, because their needs are a little bit different. And, but I think the core need for IIS is the same. So I think we can serve it, like VMware, for example. They have one set of products, and they can apply it for everybody. It's just the pricing and the features may be different, but the engine is the same. You market it differently, too, but the product can stay the same. We just need to make sure we address all markets and we understand what they want. Okay, so I'm, I'm being told that I'm out of time, but um, yeah. So uh, there's my email in this presentation. So if anybody has ideas and thoughts on how to do it better, we're totally looking for it. And if anybody wants to volunteer to become a, you know, a program manager function in the community, we would welcome that too. And uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. <laughs>